Um, great. So uh, I just want to show um, a bit about how carbon farming uh, is not just science fiction, it's happening now. Um, so it's really brilliant to introduce that in this video. Uh, and Neil's touched upon this already. So uh, why do we want to do stagnant farming? Um, so currently, um, we've actually been digging up and draining our bogs. Um, so they end up looking, you know, it's going from a nice green, open, biodiverse landscape into uh, a barren, bare, uh, bare peat landscape, um, like this on the left. Uh, and typically, um, people will dig about 30 to 40 centimetres of peat a year. Um, which is very unsustainable because peat takes a thousand years to form one metre. Um, that's how long it takes to get one metre of peat depth. Um, so clearly it's unsustainable to harvest that um, and that will lead to unsustainable products such as moss, um, the compost, the growing media. Um, and as we've, uh, as we've developed our knowledge we've realised that's unsustainable and we need an alternative. Um, so solar farming could offer one way for that. So to tackle this, um, there's been work going on in Europe, um, in Germany, Holland, uh, and in Canada as well. Um, but we've set up in Sagan Farms, the first ones of their kind in the UK. Uh, so we have two contrasting sites. One is in Manchester. Uh, as you can see from the photo, um, it's often very rainy. Uh, and our other site is down in Leicestershire uh, on a very shallow peat site, um, which is often a lot sunnier. So we've got these two different sites we're using to see how sagan grows and how we can farm it in the most efficient way to produce those volumes that Neil was discussing. So for our site setup, um, to make a farm, obviously you need some sort of seeds. Um, and so sphagnum doesn't actually produce seeds. So luckily we came to Neil and he's produced um, this wonderful range of products that we can use. So we have beader hunlix, uh, which are us that act as small plug plants, um, which are sort of any species you like, you can tailor it from a small amount of moss, uh, propagate it up and have a large amount without damaging a donor site, um, which is typically how other segment farms have operated in the past. Uh, the sort of really useful part here is in the UK, because we've actually damaged sort of over 80% of our peatlands, you may not have a donor site you can take sagging from, uh, and many have uh, legal protections. So being able to grow your own moss and grow it um, without taking anything from another site is really important. Um, and we've also trialled innovative irrigation solutions and different mulch covers um, compared to other projects. And this is to see whether we can increase the growth uh, and the yield. Uh, this slide we have a wide variety of methods we're using to monitor how successful we are. Um, so we're measuring the water table, the water uh, moisture content in the peat, and we're looking at the ground surface change, uh, as well as a whole other range of things, looking at growth using photo capture and laser scanners, um, as well as getting a whole load of data on weather station, soil nutrients and water. And we've seen some really promising results. Um, so you know, these are the first results of their kind. Um, so I'm going to just give you an idea of our Leicestershire site. Um, so this is a very shallow peat site. Typically, I think if you asked anybody a few years ago whether we could grow sphagnum here, uh, people would have laughed. They'd have said it's impossible. Um, but we've seen some really interesting stuff. So this is from our Leicestershire site. Um, at the top right, you can sort of see an example of how the plugs look when we plant them. They're very small, about sort of two, three centimetres wide. Um, and in the first six months, we planted them quite late in the year. Uh, so it didn't really have a full growing season. So we weren't expecting much growth, but we still saw relatively, great, relatively nice growth across all our treatments. Um, all of them are above the green line in the graph. Uh, and they typically looked like the image on your bottom right um, at about six months. Uh, however, the really exciting part came after then. Um, we sort of entered the growing season of 2019. Um, and despite this being sort of one of the hottest summers on record, uh, we saw this growth I'm going to show you in the next slide. So this is an image from our uh, laser scanner. Um, we've used to sort of scan all the plots. 
Uh, at each site, there's about 40 of these cells. Uh, and once the, uh, once the summer growing season really got going, um, by about September at the end of it, we saw this amazing growth. So hopefully you all saw that. Um, I'll play it once more because it's really cool. If you watch the green markers in the sort of middle of the image, you'll see as the growing season um, has gone on, we've achieved nearly 100% um, cover of our stagnum. Um, and this is really essential to get the best uh, conditions of growth. Um, stagnum creates its own water table, uh, and by meshing together, it allows water to be shared more freely, um, allowing the stagnum to survive uh, throughout the summer. And so how does this relate to carbon farming? Um, obviously, we need to monitor the greenhouse gas emissions to see if we're doing what we promised. Uh, so in this picture, this is a typical setup of um, using a lost GATOS carbon flux monitor. Um, and you attach a collar, seen in sort of the, bottom, the middle left, to your, to your surface, attach a, um, a dome to the top, and the greenhouse gas analyzer then measures the different gas fluxes over time. So the carbon in, the carbon out, um, the methane, etc., and gives you an overall balance. So this is a, an example of the data we're getting, um, and the story here is really exciting. So over the first sort of five six months, uh, while the stagnum was establishing, our site was still a source of carbon uh, because it didn't have that protective stagnum cover that we've been talking about. Uh, and then when we came into July, um, we, we started getting that really good sphagnum cover. And uh, the carbon story, you see, compared to the blue area is a bare, bare peat. So that's continuously remained a source of carbon. Whereas the orange line shows uh, the sphagnum hummocks. So in July, when we reached that really nice sort of near 100% cover, we started to see our plots becoming a carbon sink actively taking carbon from the atmosphere and storing it um, on our plots. So we can now confidently say that after a short establishment phase, we are actually farming carbon, um, which is brilliant. Uh, on a site that somebody suggested we'd never be able to grow sphagnum, we've now got it growing and it's doing what we want it to do. The other uh, aspect of our research we've been looking at is, can we grow peat-friendly food? Um, typically, we've uh, developed agriculture in a, you know, based on dry, dry land techniques. Agriculture sort of developed in the Middle East, um, and we've kind of forced our land in the UK to meet that ideal. So we've drained it, put in these dry species that aren't tolerant of water logging. Uh, and the idea is whether that in the wrong way. Is there a new way we can do that? Um, so by restoring our wetlands and putting in species that are suited to wet conditions, uh, we can hopefully develop new crops. So as Annie was talking about in the film, um, we've got British blue rice. Uh, the, the blue is sci-fi, but the, the plant isn't. Um, so just a small uh, section of results. Um, so we've been looking at a species called Glyceria fluotans. Uh, it's common name is sweet manna grass. Um, it's been used in the past in sort of Eastern Europe uh, as a nutritious seed. People would gather it from the wild, but it's, it's never been domesticated. It's been sort of overlooked as a crop until now. Um, as far as we know, we're the first people looking at it. Um, and it's, it's got a really nice nutrition profile. Um, it would certainly be useful for animal feed at the moment, but we're hoping we can do various growing trials, see whether the seeds um, and the yield is similar to commercial crops and whether we can use that as a source of food for people in the future. Uh, so this is quite an exciting part. Um, it's a little bit behind Sphagnum in terms of its research, um, but like in Andy's film, you know, the ambition is with, with future work, we can really develop this as an alternative food source um, because we need, we need alternatives uh, to farming in peatland areas, such as the Fens of East, England, East Anglia. Uh, so overall, why, do our, why does our research matter? Um, so we've shown that it's possible to grow sphagnum 
on a variety of settings, especially on shallow peak using irrigation. Um, and this greatly increases the area where we can cultivate sphagnum, um, especially across these agriculturalized soils. Uh, this means we can start producing um, you know, towards our 3 million cubic meters a year that the UK needs for, for peat alternatives. Um, and by producing our own alternative replacement, we can actually stop the problem being exported elsewhere um, and really solve the solution. Um, and again, with more research, we can develop new crops. There's been a whole heap of polluticulture research across the world. Um, so we're hoping we can contribute to that. Uh, and government attitudes to peatlands are changing. Um, we realise that they have potential to help combat climate change. So by developing uh, ways of farming on them, but still saving carbon and sequestering it, we'll hopefully get the best of both worlds in the future. Um, and in the future, we have loads of other projects. Uh, the most exciting one is called Waterworks, um, launching in East Anglian Fens. Uh, we're going to trial out a whole range of crops. We've got four or five key crops, uh, a load of novel polluticulture crops as well. Um, and this will really help us kickstart polluticulture research in the UK. And finally, just a big thanks to all our project partners. Some of them are on the call today. 